Welcome to Talking Heads on USA Global TV, starring the one and only wonderful Dr. Jacqueline. It's a prestigious place where world-class influencers and experts meet, and where you'll find the most trusted advisors and coaches for all things in life and business. Visit usaglobaltv.com to sign up for our newsletter, get the value you need, and be first in line to learn about events and giveaways and other valuable content. Connect with us. Email Dr. Jacqueline at usaglobaltv.com to talk about how you can become part of USA Global TV. That's USA Global TV, where the doctor is always in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to USA Global TV, and hello to our friends listening on Business Talk Radio. I am Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck, and our show today is The Wise Ones. Joining me here, as always, is one of our key team members here at USA Global TV. He is our co-host. He is a talking head, which means he is an expert presenter, and he is an elevated listener. He is also a publisher, an author, and a book coach. And and I have to say he is a dear friend. Let's bring him on, Mr. Red O'Loughlin. Welcome to the program. Thank you so very much, Dr. Jacqueline. I really appreciate being here. It just it it's so nice just to, to be with you. We we share many hours per week together, but rarely do we share them both together in live TV. So that's always a, a nice thing to have. It, it is, especially with this beautiful background behind us. I feel like we actually are in person together, so we're enjoying it. Yeah. yeah, stay dry. Yes, for sure. But Red, you brought another fantastic guest to the platform. But before we bring him out, I want to spotlight you. You have such an amazing background. I, I'm really thrilled that I had the opportunity to interview you and find out more. But in addition to everything I already mentioned, you are a longevity expert. You, you blog every single day. You've helped me personally with my own health. Tell us a little bit more about your background. Well, I'm the oldest of nine kids, Navy brat, uh, moved all over the place when uh, I was younger. My mom had this interesting habit. Everywhere my dad was stationed, she had a kid. So there's two Virginians, two Californians, two Panamanians, two Texans, and a Puerto Rican. And uh, most of us are still alive. Three have passed on. But I am the oldest. And actually, it's it's interesting because as I was going through school, my Dad got a job out in California. We were living down in Corpus Christi, and I was left behind with my next oldest brother. And then before long, he was gone, and I was here by myself, and uh, things led on. And you know, eventually I bumped into my wife, and then it, it just a, a cascade of things happened. Uh, finished college. My love of my life is chemistry. Uh, I've had that since I was a sophomore in high school. And I use that every day now in my my research and my blogging. But I never got a chance to become a chemist. I got an invitation to Vietnam. Uh, and then 31 years later, I got out of the Navy. Now, part of that 20 years was actually in the reserves. So I have a, a, a very wide breadth of background in logistics engineering, quality engineering, reliability engineering, uh, a lot of statistics. I used to teach statistics at night at college for several years. And one thing I'm, I'm very proud of, I went to University of Houston, I was working on a, a PhD, and I went in and talked to this staff professor. And in 15 minutes, he waved nine hours of statistics. And I, that, to me, is one of my, my most favorite things I like to tell people. But uh, it's not often that you can get nine hours away, but I did. And it was uh, just a delightful conversation in 15 minutes. But beyond that, I research what goes on in the human body at the cellular level. I look for chemical reactions. What is what's causing something else to happen? You treat the cause, you can fix a problem. You treat a symptom, you'll always treat the symptom. In addition to that, I help new authors get their books published. And that's what I do basically on a day-in-day -day basis. And you do it so well, Red. Thank you. And I just want to let our audience know that Red and I, as he mentioned, we do meet every week. It's been over a year at least. Yeah. And he's always a gentleman. He's always on time. He's got that <laughs> that discipline and that structure and that training. I urge you to reach out to him. If you are a new author and you are looking to get a book published, please do reach out to Red. His information is there, his website. Uh, we also have a, a hello from a friend of the show. Hi, David. Nice to have you back with us. He's joining us from the UK. All right. So, Red, do tell us all about Dr. David, who is backstage. 
Dr. David Schein. He is a friend, he's a lawyer, an author, a speaker, and he's a management professor at the Cameron School of Business in the University of Southern University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. Uh, he's not very far from me right this minute as, as that goes about 20 miles across the way. But anyway, Dave is a, is a dear friend and as he pops up, you're gonna notice he has a little doodad on his uh, coat. Mine's Navy uh, NFO Wings, Naval Flight Officer. Uh, he has a, a pin that we were just chatting about very briefly before the show started. So David, as you come in, uh, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about the pin and then kind of go into a little bit of your background. What, what should people really know about you? Fantastic. Let's welcome him to the show. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Red. Thank you, Dr. Jacqueline. And uh, what a great day as we uh, have a uh, winter advisory um, closing in on us. But uh, you know what? It's it's all bright and sunny inside, isn't it? <laughs> it is down here in Florida. That's for sure. It's an absolutely it's, gorgeous uh, day. It's just great. Um, I uh, committed in my earlier education to be a professor at some point in my life. And uh, I didn't realize quite the path it would take. But um, I've uh, uh, my uh, pin is for the University of St. Thomas, and it, it represents some key icons that they have uh, uh, in in their uh, motto and in their uh, insignia. And I, I wear it proudly. I have about uh, a dozen of them, one on each suit. And uh, I'm uh, very happy to assist the university in getting their word out. Um, it's a small Catholic university, about 3,500 students, and we're located uh, in what's called the Montrose area of Houston. We're, we're fairly close to downtown Houston, and uh, I have uh, strong ties to Houston, even though I uh, uh, grew up up north. So I, I was uh, born in the city of brotherly love. I was born in Philadelphia and raised near Boston, though. And uh, my dad, uh, similar to Red, I was, uh, my dad was career Navy. And uh, a big turning point in my life was my dad was transported to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, which is uh, Navy City, USA. And I went to senior high there and I did, uh, I did well with the encouragement of my parents. Um, I'm the oldest of seven kids. My parents would not have been able to support me through college, but uh, I was uh, fortunate to win a full scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, part of the Ivy League. And uh, it was a, a difficult and life-changing experience for me. I started college as a pre-med and came out as a uh, pre-law. So it was quite a difference. I also had my own business in college and I did a weekly one hour radio program for WHYY, which is uh, still the public radio station in Philadelphia. So I had a bit of uh, an, an interesting experience uh, while I was in college because I uh, ran with a very different crowd than I would have seen on the uh, on the campus. I went on to get uh, an MBA full time at the University of Virginia and then went to my first connection to Houston as I moved here to uh, pursue my law degree at the University of Houston and got uh, connected to the oil industry. And so my first uh, uh, career was in the oil industry when I was in law school and when I got out of law school. But uh, when I finished law school, I said, you know, I am going to do this for a, a, a period of time. I'm going to have a successful career as an attorney. But at some point, I want to turn that around and give back and be involved in higher education. So uh, right about 20 years ago, I actually went and sat for the graduate record exam, which is how you get into a Ph.D. program, as Red and, and Dr. Jacqueline know. And uh, I went back to school full time to pursue my Ph.D. at the University of Virginia. And uh, that was a very interesting experience because I was about uh, 15 years older then the next oldest person in my PhD cohort and uh, finished ahead of everybody and got out there. And then I've been full-time higher ed. I continue to have an active law and consulting practice, but uh, that's how I got here today. And I have moved through the ladder. I am a, uh, a full professor here in, in, with tenure and I'm the uh, Cameron Endowed Chair of Management and Marketing. So I've achieved a lot of those uh, milestones that I had in my mind um, uh, quite a while ago when I finished law school. 
Well, Dave, I know that. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. That's that's quite a lot. Before I get into the first thing, I'm also helping David get his book published. Uh, we hit the put a publish button today on his paperback. His ebook is published and available, and I'm going to let him talk about that later. But part of that last little bit was you were over in uh, Africa for a little bit of time there. Uh, could you? Give us a little idea why Africa and what were you doing and, and how things go. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, I uh, cannot take any credit for putting the trip together. Uh, uh, Miss Karen, my uh, better half, uh, was part of her bucket list, and uh, it's a lot of work. She spent about a year working with uh, multiple travel agents putting the trip together, and uh, the uh, first uh, uh, finances that she got on the bid were uh, rather heart stopping. So she then had to do this all over again to, to get it to something that uh, people who are both college professors could afford to do. And she did a very good job at that. And so it was a very ambitious trip. Uh, we uh, went to Nairobi, flew to Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, we then did a, a four day safari uh, camp at the Maasai Mara which is uh, a beautiful area. We saw many, many of the major animals, uh, elephants, uh, giraffes, uh, Cape Town water buffalo, uh, uh, hyenas, of course, and warthogs, and many different types of antelopes and gazelles. Uh, we then tran uh, transferred from there to uh, Tanzania, and we did a couple more safari days. We went to the largest crater in the world, which is the Nagoro Nagoro uh, Crater. It's uh, several hours from the nearest airport, so it's a you know a bit of a, a transit experience. And uh, it, it, the bottom of the crater is an African wildlife preserve, and it's it's rather fascinating. We saw. Uh, we caught something that some safari people never see. We saw two rhinos mating, and nearby we saw an, uh, a couple ostriches mating. So uh, I know it sounds funny to say that, but when you get into the safari business, just taking pictures of animals is kind of, you know, yeah, that's pretty mediocre. But if you see the mating or you see a kill, and I don't know if we want to get too far into kills, but uh, uh, those are considered, wow, you really did it. You really saw something. And we then went to uh, kind of my requested part of the trip, which was to go to Zimbabwe and to tour Victoria Falls. And uh, like many Americans, I've been to Niagara Falls more than once, and it is a beautiful place. Uh, but the sheer magnitude of Zimbabwe and the Victoria Falls is, is rather unbelievable. It takes approximately an hour to walk the length, one direction to walk the length of Victoria Falls to give people a, a, a reference point. And uh, so that was uh, rather uh, stunning. Did that on Christmas morning, walked into the uh, Victoria Falls. Uh, Falls Park and uh, had that wonderful experience. And uh, then from Zimbabwe, uh, went to South Africa. South Africa is a very educational experience. Uh, I think as a well-educated American, I did not know enough about the evils of apartheid and what the uh, people of South Africa uh, went through. And so I got to Johannesburg, I did a tour of Soweto, which has about 2 million people and is the, uh, the center of the uh, black population in Johannesburg. Johannesburg, again, a very large city. And um, I got a chance to tour a museum there that was dedicated to some of the, um, the rather sad things as apartheid began to fall apart. And then uh, went to Pretoria. Uh, there is a gigantic statue of Nelson Mandela and got to see that. Behind it is what they called the Union, which would be parallel to our Capitol building. Uh, then did yet another safari over by the Kruger National Park. Kruger National Park is the far northeastern corner of the country of South Africa, which as most know, covers the whole tip of South Africa. And uh, that was, uh, a, a got to see some more animals and some more interesting things. And then uh, concluded my trip in Cape Town. 
and um, got to go up to Robins Island. Robins Island is as Alcatraz is to the United States, an island prison. Robins Island is a prison that sits in the harbor of Cape Town, and it is where Nelson Mandela spent 17 years. And it was very interesting and educational experience. While in Cape Town, I did get to go to the Cape of Good Hope, which uh, as many know, is not the absolute bottom of South Africa, but it's pretty close. And so you're right near the very end of a whole continent. So it was uh, a four weeks start to finish, but a very intense four weeks. One of my responsibilities in the Navy was was Africa. Uh, I was stationed in Stuttgart, Germany. But Africa is such a massive continent and people have no idea how big it is. We can actually take three complete continental United States and put in there and have plenty of room left over. Uh, I'm sure probably on your way down there, it just seemed like an, you were never going to get there. And when you were traveling, uh, give, give me an idea what the what, what your view is or your feelings about how how big Africa is. Well, it um, the the getting there from Houston because of COVID and things like that, uh, it's a, a 11 or 12 hour flight from here to Heathrow and then an, a 12 hour flight from Heathrow to Nairobi. And so it, it, you're, you're covering some vast differences. Uh, one of the parks that I was at in Africa had a road sign to different places. And to give you an idea, just uh, uh, getting to Cairo, Egypt was 5,600 miles. And so it, it is a vast continent. And in the four weeks I was there, I was actually in five countries because uh, kind of an oddity when you're Victoria Falls gaps uh zambia and zimbabwe so i actually while i was there walked across a train trestle into uh zambia and back so i could add that fifth country to my trip but it is uh these countries are vast and as i said south africa itself um has uh i think three time zones and it is a vast uh country just just south africa yeah, 5,600 miles is almost two lengths across the United States. Yes. And Nairobi is quite a ways north of, of Cape Town on top yes. of that. So, well, I know you're a chef occasionally and you love food. Did you get a chance to taste any really good, interesting meals in, in Africa? Yes. Uh, one of the things that people might not think about when they're thinking about safaris, I think they might be thinking about hot dogs and hamburgers or maybe even cold sandwiches. And one of the the, the interesting things about these uh, safari camps uh, is they're set up for tenderfoots like me. And I'm I'm very fit, but I'm not you know, Mr. Outdoorsman with my my little pup tent running around the Appalachians or anything. And um, every night they served a gourmet meal. And I mean, uh, on par with a five star restaurant. And so that was a, a, a big surprise. So the food across the board was I, I w- would say was was very good. A lot of fresh vegetables, uh, a, a good incorporation of fresh fruit, uh, a lot of food that we would normally encounter here. They served uh, breakfast out on the range a few times. And you would a lot of things you encounter here, you know, sausages, bacon, eggs, uh, pancakes, things like that. Uh, while I was there, I did have uh, Udu which is in the antelope family and it tasted like steak and um i I was traveling with some people who had ostrich and that tastes like it doesn't taste like chicken uh it tastes like steak so it was a little bit of a variety there but overall the the food uh, across the board i was very fortunate to have some very nice meals i know dave you speak a lot in many different places uh online zoom etc and you mentioned earlier that you were a uh, radio talk show host or something in college. Uh, what what did you learn out of that that's really helped you in your professional world? Well, um, I think I got this from my mom. My mother uh, is uh, uh, a direct Irish descendant and quite a talker. And her father, <laughs> my grandfather, was hard of hearing. So my mother grew up speaking, not yelling, but speaking with projection. So all of the seven of us uh, as adults speak with projection 
because we mimicked my mother. And so I've always been somebody who could stand in a room and speak very comfortably and uh, was inspired by my mom to, to do that. So I was a debater in high school, won a district championship, did stuff like that. And then when I went to college, I was not on the college debate team. I, I was uh, interested, but I did all sorts of stuff. I did public contact stuff. I taught in the uh, on the Penn campus, they had what's called the free university. And I, I ran uh, public speaking classes. And I also joined the college radio station. And a bit of trivia, the Penn radio station was started by Hal Prince, the Broadway producer, when he was a student at Penn. Doctor, a, I just wanted to interject. I'm a Philly girl myself. So I spent a lot of my life in Philadelphia. And I went back after being born in Philly, I went back uh, to, to Penn for college. And what happened was, is I was on the Penn radio station doing arts an arts show uh, for about a year. And then public radio came to me and said, we heard your show. Would you be interested in moving over to WHYY? And so uh, my last two and a half years at, uh, at Penn, I was on WHYY. Uh, the advantage to that is that I was invited to some theater things and I got to meet some celebrities when I was still at Penn Radio. But when I was at HYY, um, I met many, many, many celebrities, uh, including uh, Carol Channing, uh, the uh, comedy team of Stiller and Mirror, uh, J uh, Dionne Warwick, uh, many, many uh, people who were popular at that time would do uh, either regular stock or summer stock in Philadelphia. And as a representative of WHYY, I got to go to a lot of these uh, press meetings and press luncheons and stuff. So for a 20 or 21 year old kid from the other side of the tracks, uh, it was uh, quite a quite a, a, an experience. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping to to do something with that uh, uh, in terms of writing. Um, I'm actually was thinking of doing a book on it, but I'm actually thinking of creating a TV show based on that experience. You didn't run into Dr. Jacqueline way back when? <laughs> no, we didn't run no, into I each other. To, no, we didn't. That's a shame. Uh, we have a comment from one of our team members, Janetta Barry, and she writes, Jambo, Dr. David from Janetta in Nairobi, <laughs> Kenya. Jambo. And uh, I, I had a great visit to Nairobi, even though I went out to the safari, I spent a day touring in Nairobi. And a couple of highlights I want to put in a, a, a pitch for the Sidrick, uh, Richard Sidrick um, uh, Elephant Sanctuary. And this is a unique operation that you can go to as a tourist every day from 10 to 11 in the morning. You can go there and they bring out baby elephants who have been rescued from the wild. And you can also adopt an elephant. It's very reasonable. It's fifty dollars to adopt an elephant. Uh, you don't get to take them home, of course. But they actually use uh, trucks and helicopters when a, a mama elephant has uh, has been hurt or killed or dies. The baby will starve to death in the wild, and so they take these babies in. And they had uh, twenty three elephants in two fleets. They have a bunch of baby elephants. And that's, of course, just ridiculously cute. And then they have kind of the uh, teenagers who are not really teenagers, but they're three to five year old elephants. And uh, the caretakers actually sleep with the elephants to help them because they're social animals and things like that. So it's a very interesting experience. But again, that's their Richard Cedric uh, Elephant Sanctuary in Nairobi. And it is a very good charity if people are interested. Uh, shortly after that, I went to the Giraffe Center, also in Nairobi. And uh, you get to feed giraffes and, and see them. And you get to learn more about giraffes and, and their life uh, and things like that. Um, one of the things that people might not connect is the famous book uh, by um, um, it is called Out of Africa. And uh, the home of Karen, and I think it's Bexley, uh, was uh, part of the tour and uh, got to see her home. And of course, she eventually went back home, did not stay in Africa for the rest of her life. But uh, out of Africa, one of our other books was made into a, an, a motion picture also. So she's a very successful author. So it was interesting to uh, tour her home while we were there. 
Dave, you uh, have quite an extensive academic background. Are there any particular courses you really loved? And is there any that you really feel super good about projecting as you're in front of an audience, as you're teaching? Gosh, um, I think one of the more formative experiences for me in the classroom was the first year of the MBA program at the University of Virginia. Uh, Virginia uh, executives back in the 1950s said, you know, uh, there's those cats up at Harvard and all those Ivy Leaguers, but we need a major Southern business school and uh, we're going to make that happen. And uh, Colgate Darden, uh, I think, was a, a former governor of the state of Virginia. And I and uh, so Virginia became the host of this new experiment in a southern major business school. And it was like a boot camp uh, once you were signed in there. And by the way, it's many leading MBA programs do not take people right out of college. But in my case, I qualified because I had been studying business, eventually transitioning from pre-med to business. But also, I had my own business that grew out of the radio show. So I was doing radio, and performers would actually come up to me and say, you don't do drugs, do you? And this was the, the time period. This is the Woodstock generation, this was what we call sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And uh, because I, even though I had a beard, I, I had shoulder length hair, I looked like most of the other people in my age bracket. Um, but I had that bright look to myself as someone who was not high on drugs. And you could tell that people in the business certainly knew that. And so what happened was, is I ended up with a stable of about 12 performers and I created a business. I had two people who were older than me who worked with me in the business, an art director and a music director. And because I had had my own business in college, uh, the uh, Darden School took a chance on me and brought me into their MBA program. But the MBA program, like I said, the first year you went to class from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. five days a week. And they didn't care what your undergraduate major was. I had studied econ. I was not I hadn't studied accounting or finance or any other disciplines. And so it was quite an experience for me to have that boot camp experience. And that did make a difference in my life because it gave me that really substantial business foundation that I've used over and over again. And it, I think it helps me even today as a, a college professor. I teach business law, but I also teach management. And I'm uh, running the MBA capstone which is a, uh, a course that brings a, a simulation, brings together all of the different courses that MBA candidates study. And it, it helps me to have had that real solid background uh, way back when. I noticed that, go ahead, Dr. Jacqueline, you sound like you wanted to say something. Yes, I just wanted to ask, Doctor, so in your experience with all of your education and your professor, how has the whole education system changed? I know there's been a lot of profound changes, but if you could sum it up, what would you share about that? Well, I think going back to my Penn experience, uh, honestly, and I know a lot of people speak very highly of Penn, and I don't want to sound like a, 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 a a negative person, but my experience in the classroom at Penn was not a positive one until I got into the graduate courses at the Wharton School, and I was taking them as an undergraduate, and that worked very well for me. But uh, a lot of the professors back then really didn't care whether you were in the classroom or not. They had a paycheck. Uh, they were going to come do whatever they did. And one of the things that I've seen over this uh, almost roughly 50 year period involved with higher education on and off is that today there's a lot more focus on the student. We're more concerned about the mental health of our students. Uh, even at, I mentioned the Darden experience, a lot of the discussion at Darden is to, to make it a more humane experience because it, it that boot camp experience is pretty tough uh, on uh, the, on people. So I think we, we have to pay more attention. Certainly, 
uh, disability accommodation is um, is a big deal. If you talk to people or professors like myself, and I talk to other professors, uh, we're expected to be much more responsive to our students than I experienced in my in my early going. And I even saw the difference because, as I mentioned, I went back later in life to get my PhD. And so I have been a student in this century. If, <laughs> it's kind of hard to relate to that. But remember, 2000, we changed centuries. And so I went to my PhD program from 2002 to 2005. So I'm still reasonably connected to the student experience. And I can relate to the students uh, in, in the current generation. And a lot of discussion about millennials and um, I think there's a lot of focus of our students today that want a more humane experience. And that doesn't mean that we dumb it down. And I, I, I resent people who say you're dumbing down higher education. I think being a human being and communicating with your students is not dumbing it down. Now, if you take material out of the classroom, you don't teach as much material. That's a different story. But in terms of, of communicating with your students, well, I, I don't think there's a replacement for that. Thank you. I noticed, I noticed when you worked with the oil companies, you kind of shifted into an HR role, which yes. gave a, a totally different perspective on things. You want to share a little bit about how you got into that and, and what you gained? Sure. Well, uh, interestingly, uh, even though I, I didn't have an accounting or finance background, um, I was a tax major in law school, <laughs> and so as I approached my last semester in law school, I said, you know, this tax stuff, it changes every week, and at that time, they were changing the Eternal Revenue Code. Literally, every session of Congress, something got changed, and I said, you know, I, I'm really not that thrilled with being a tax lawyer, and so I took a, a labor law course my last semester in law school, and then when I came out, uh, Shell Oil was recruiting. I'd worked for Gulf Oil in, in law school and gas contracts. But when I came out, Shell was recruiting and Shell said, well, we'd like to try you in human resources. And I said, uh, sure. So I worked uh, in the head office. Uh, I used my legal training primarily to be kind of an internal consultant on legal employment issues. I did briefs for them and things like that. And uh, in only two months, the uh, Shell people came to me and said, hey, guess what? You're doing great. We're going to move you to California. <laughs> Three weeks notice to move halfway across the country. And uh, that, was, uh, that was quite an experience. And I got dropped into one of Shell's outposts in California, uh, in Modesto, California, which is uh, part of the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, they did it to me again. I, I did well in the facility out in California, which no longer exists, by the way, but was there then. Uh, they moved me to the huge Shell Norco refinery, which uh, sits uh, not too far from the uh, big Moisson field, the big uh, airport in New Orleans. So if you've ever flown into New Orleans and you fly over a huge refinery, that was my uh, third duty station in less than two years with uh, Shell Oil. And so that was very interesting with a different assignment. So uh, I got a kind of a real indoctrination by fire uh, with, uh, and Shell also had a, sent me to some seminars and uh, uh, provided some internal training. So I got a pretty good background in a hurry. Sounds quite interesting. Dr. Jacqueline, do you have anything you want to inject at this time? I think my head is levitating off of my shoulders. <laughs> I can't believe all the things that you've accomplished. Attorney, professor, PhD, world traveler, author, radio show host. There's definitely a television. I think there's a movie that's coming out with your name on it. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, I, I was, I've been joking with people uh, that uh, I think I'm going to do a, an autobiography called Semi-Famous. Uh, yeah, you know, just you know, there's certain people know your name. It's like, gee, it's kind of interesting. I'm not famous, but it seems kind of, uh, kind of interesting. But I, I do have an active mind, and um, um, a couple of things that I, I, I mentioned one thing earlier that Red doesn't know about because Red's working with me on my new book, and uh, which is out, I think today, right? It's out on Amazon. 
but also um, he doesn't know that I'm working on a musical review. And um, I, uh, like a lot of people, again, I came out of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I was a non-druggy, as I said. Uh, but it was interesting because I was certainly a fan of rock and roll music, but I came up with an interesting concept, and we're rolling with it. Uh, the, the musical is called Novel T, the word novel dash the capital T, and we've, uh, we've got that website, by the way. And it is a musical of about 30 novelty songs from the rock and roll era. And uh, My Boy Lollipop, uh, Yakety Yak by the Coasters, uh, Jolly Green Giant Sign, Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Polka Dot Bikini, um, Henry VIII, uh, Werewolves of London. So I've uh, weaved these um, uh, novelty songs, about 30 of them, into a, a very family-oriented musical, and uh, because the nature of it uh, is, it's a, it's a little bit more work than it sounds because we're now working on getting the performance rights for all 30 of those songs. So it's already written, but I can't uh, produce it until we are able to get the correct uh, uh, rights to all of those songs. Well, first of all, congratulations about your book launch today. That's huge. Thank you. Should we tell people what it is, yes. Ray, or do you want to tell them? <laughs> tell no, them. I was going to suggest that we go to commercial break because I know it's something that's pretty critical to the show. And then we get back into some really serious things here at the end and, and let David shine a little bit, so to speak. <laughs> and I also want to find out what's involved in getting those permissions so that you can do that with those 30 songs. I think that would be really interesting as well. Happy to talk about it. All right, folks, we're going to take a break and we're actually going to watch uh, two clips. The first one is uh, a new movie that is coming out. And one of our friends here on the platform, his name is Paul Connolly. And Red and I both have been working on the chapter that he has in my new book. Uh, called Adversity to Awesome. And then we're going to follow it up with a short music video from one of our team members, Madeline Chan, who is also a co-host on the music and film show. So let's take a look. Big boys, don't cry. We'll be right back. Look at that place. Most people. We need to talk to you about your time growing up in St. Nena's children's home. Six of your eight housemates committed suicide, Mr. Connolly. I'm afraid I have to tell you that another child in your care home, Liam Carroll, has also recently taken his own life. Jason, Terry, and
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to USA Global TV and Business Talk Radio. Our show today is The Wise Ones, and a big thanks to Paul Connolly and Big Boys Don't Cry Productions, as well as Madeline Chan. I'm here with Red and Dr. David, and we've got such a great conversation going. I just want to just get my question and we'll go over to you, Red. So Dr. David, what's involved in getting the approval for those 30 songs? Are they permits, licenses? How does that work? Very good question. And I had to learn, you know, just because you're an attorney doesn't mean you know everything about everything uh, legally related. But I am a very careful person. I, again, have worked with artists and I have worked with performers and things in the past. And I want to make sure that people get credit and get their royalties and things like that. So I don't I, I would not want to do a, uh, a bootleg production of something. So we want to do everything by the book. So having said that, uh, most of you know, if a song is performed publicly, a royalty is collected and there's two major outlets, ASCAP and BMI. And virtually all recorded music is with one or the other organization. They collect the royalty, keep a small percentage, and make sure that the artist on record for that particular song gets gets their money. And uh, what the problem is, is that if you are doing a stage play as we are, you cannot use ASCAP and BMI. It doesn't work that way. You have to have what's called a grand performance license. So for all 30 songs that I have selected, we need to have a grand performance license and we are in that process now and to give you an idea because uh, you probably figured out i'm kind of busy but i'm working with uh one of my favorite researchers who actually was a key researcher on my the book that's just been released um uh and uh, ricky ditmore and then uh, Taylor Calacomo, who is a senior here at the University of St. Thomas. Ricky is now a first-year law student at South Texas College of Law. Those two gentlemen are working together to explore the wild world of getting Dr. Shine his royalty arrangements <laughs> for each of the 30 songs. So we're uh, early in that process, but we've made some progress. I filled in some forms the other day, and uh, but it's uh, it's not an easy process. Uh, we're also, by the way, I saw you just presented a music video. video. We're also looking for a uh, a musician or multiple musicians to do uh, write a theme song for the musical and to also prepare a score for the musical. So we're we're still uh, working on that part. We've had a couple of musicians who agreed to do it, but then you know what didn't deliver the goods. So we're still in the hunt for that. Thank you so much for sharing that because we certainly have a number of. Uh, friends of this platform, friends of mine who could possibly help you with that. So let's oh, talk about that offline. It. it was a December 7th, come back from lunch, 2007. And I was asked to go to HR at Halliburton. And they said, we have a wonderful opportunity for you to retire early. And honestly, it was a package I could not say no to. But I was certainly old enough at that time to consider retirement. And when you look at the history of Halliburton, it doesn't seem like whether you're the president, a senior VP, when you get to a certain age there, the benefits packages that they offer you for consideration are immense. And I know that's something somewhat dear to your heart uh, with age discrimination. And that was one of the things that we've been advertising on social media that you wanted to take a brief moment and talk about. So I'm going to open the, 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 door for that particular topic. Well, as an employment lawyer, and I represent businesses, by the way, I do not represent plaintiffs. I represent the organizations and I do, uh, you know, basically conservative advice. We don't want my clients to be in the courthouse or on the front page of the newspaper. It's happened occasionally, but doesn't happen very often with my people is to uh, make sure that we, uh, the clients that I work with, treat their employees fairly and uh, have a diverse workforce and uh, certainly do things the right way. But having said that, there's, there's no doubt that there are some real problems in the workplace. And I include the academic workplace. I'm not just talking about, uh, you know, private industry, and I'm talking about the public sector as well. 
is uh, having been involved in this business for 43 years now as a professional uh, in human resources and employment law, I can tell you safely without fear contradiction that the leading cause of discrimination in the United States, I don't care what you see on television or whose movement you've got uh, going on, age discrimination is twice as common as all other forms of discrimination combined. And it is also the type of claim that is least serviced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the respective state agencies. It's largely ignored because historically, it's been viewed as a problem for Red and uh, Dr. Shine and not for uh, p minorities and females. And uh, so they don't really care about us because it's like, well, you know, Red, you can go hire yourself an attorney and you can go do it yourself. We're not going to use the EEOC's resources, which are limited, to uh, to take care of it. So I know that that sounds you know pretty hyper, but uh, you know I've been doing this long enough that I I'm not really fearing contradiction uh, on that. And I think we we need to do a couple of things. One of the things is is that again I support diversity in the workplace, and I have been the affirmative action officer for a major oil company. I can tell you that where we need to focus our energies is right here in education because I can't hire a minority engineer if they haven't attended college and graduated with an engineering degree and in some cases an engineering license. So we need to increase the pool of eligible applicants. But uh, beyond that, I think businesses and organizations and the United States government need to take a, mu a much stronger view of, of age discrimination because we are wasting uh, a lot of resources. And it's fascinating because did you know federal judges have no mandatory retirement? Uh, Stephen Breyer announced his retirement the other day and he's well into his 80s and he's still collecting a paycheck from the US government. And it's like, well, if that's okay, what about the rest of us? And so uh, I, I'm very concerned about it, and I don't think there's enough attention that's been paid to it. And when you hear all the discussion about all these jobs that are going unfilled, a lot of them are not being filled because the employers and the organizations are not looking to the substantial resource we have out there called people over 50 or over 60. Bad deal for America. Let me repeat that. Bad deal for America. Dave, that is your latest book. It's available today as an ebook. It'll be available very shortly as a paperback. And it has to do with political satire and what is called the woke era. What is your definition of woke? And then I'd like to have you tell, tell our audience about your book. Okay. Well, first of all, in terms of when I hear somebody say woke, it, 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 it raises a guttural reaction of, uh, of an anti-communication approach because part of diversity, part of learning is to hear all different forms of view. And for uh, some, uh, you know, uh, Nazis out there to say, oh, well, this is the point of view that we think is appropriate this week. And we don't really care about to hear anybody else's view. And we've seen this, uh, a lot of people refer to it as cancel culture, where if you have some, you know, whack job who thinks the United States started in 1619 or 1500 or whatever, they get to go to a college campus. But if uh, Laura Ingram or uh, uh, Ann Coulter go to a college campus, oh, my goodness, they can't speak here because we wouldn't want our kind little minds here. Uh, polluted by that. And so it, to me, it's a very disturbing trend. It is an anti-educational trend in that you won't talk about the whole issue. You, you cut the sides off. And of course, we're in the midst of this right now. In just the last few days, we've got Whoopi Goldberg in, in one camp, and we've got Neil Young and Joni Mitchell going after Spotify uh, because of uh, 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 Rogan, and I have never even listened to Rogan. I don't even know what he stands for, but it's kind of like, uh, gee, guys, can't we all play in the same sandbox? 
And uh, so it, it is a very disturbing trend and an anti-intellectual trend, uh, which, which very much concerns me. Your book, Bad Deal for America, is unique as a political satire book because you have presented it as a deck of cards. How did that concept come out to you? Well, I think all the time, as you figured out, I've got the musical, I'm working on the TV show, I've got stuff in the back, we're rewriting another book, um, and I have journal articles I produce in the meantime when I'm not uh, sleeping or something, uh, is uh, Bad Deal for America came to me. Um, I had a decline of America, 100 years of leadership failures that focused on presidential leadership in the United States. And so the logical next extension was to talk about our members of Congress. So to be in the book, you had to be a member of Congress, either presently or relatively recently. Uh, there are one or two people in the book who I think are deceased now, but they were uh, alive when we uh, put the book together. But it's, um, it's based on a deck of cards, as you mentioned. But at the beginning of the book, we talk about the compensation for these people in Washington. And we, we don't put a positive spin on it because they're well cared for. And a lot of the politicians have been asking for more money. And I've been saying, no, 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 no. The reason they want more money is they're saying, well, I have two households. I have to live in Washington and I have to live in my district. Wrong. You have to live and act and participate in your district. You only need to go to Washington to vote. And I want people to be based in their home. And I wouldn't care if we bought some of the old hotels or apartment complexes and set up a dormitory and said, here, when you're in D.C., we'll give you room 28 on the third floor and you can stay there for a few days while you're voting and going to critical committee meetings. But the rest of the time, I want you in your district. So anyway, that's the outlet of the book, the beginning. We then present 26 Republicans. They're the red suites, hearts and diamonds. And then we present 26 Democrats who are the clubs and the spades. And we then have a joker. Uh, and people can guess, since I'm a conservative, who the joker is. And we then wrap up by talking about some of the people who have a substantial wealth, uh, um, which does not seem to be what we really intended people to be in Washington to do. And so uh, and then we talk about the convention of states at the very end of the book. And I'm not a huge convention of states person, but I can tell you that given that we have not been successful at getting term limits put through Washington, that uh, a lot of people are starting to come to the conclusion, including myself, that we may need a convention of states. So anyway, that's the book. It's a brief book. I think it's about 230 pages and it's designed to be interesting, but to stimulate thought. And it's unique because when we were doing competitor analysis, trying to figure out where do you fit in the categories and the keywords and the pricing and all that, there isn't anything out there like that that we could really find. So what you have is is not only unique in the political satire world, but unique in the, the deck of cards presentation and in so many other ways. It's it's really a major uh, piece of, of literature for people who really want to know what, what's really behind all this stuff, because every single thing you say in there has a footnote or a reference of something they said. I mean, there's nothing in there that's your speculation. It is fact. Right. And and it, actually, it, what one of the interesting things was just finding out the compensation and the benefits that they have as members of Congress, that this is stuff that's just not all in one source on the internet, or you would think you'd be able to go to .gov and there would be a point that says, here's how much we're paying these people in Congress. Not like that. And as I mentioned, we had a couple of re researchers who spent months working with me to find the pieces that we documented in the book. But being a professor and, and being a nonfiction author, I'm very serious about having the, the citations and the quotations so that anybody reading the book can go to our sources and see that we didn't exaggerate these things. Yeah. I think you treated everybody equally because as I read through a red card, you know, there's stuff in there. They said they, they're responsible for that. That that was their position at that time. They may have changed, doesn't matter, but but they said that. And so it doesn't matter whether it's a, a blue card or a red card. Uh, your presentation was on spot with regard to hey, this is what these people are about. 
Well, thank you so much, Red. And and obviously, it, 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 one of the parts that people don't see is my previous book took four, four years to put together and then a year in what I call pre-publication. And this book took over two years to put together and then has been in pre-publication for about eight or nine months now. And it, so this stuff's not trivial on our end. And hopefully we'll find a lot of people that enjoy reading it. It's a very creative approach. I look forward to reading it. And you said it's available on Amazon as of this very minute. A absolutely. And we'll be getting some hard copy books out shortly as well. Wonderful. As we're getting to the end of the show, I have one thing that just begs my my question, because I looked at that and I said, is that Dave? And it says, Argentine tango dancer. How did that come about? <laughs> <laughs> I was living in Virginia. I was teaching in Virginia and um, I started going to ballroom dancing. And um, as an outgrowth of that, somebody introduced me to Argentine tango, which is a very specialized form of ballroom dancing. And so I became hooked on Argentine tango, um, got connected while in Virginia to a professional uh, tango coach here in Houston. And I worked with my tango coach, uh, Joan Bishop, for uh, right from about 2013 all the way up until uh, March of 2020 when we had the COVID shutdown. And so I have not done tango in the last two years because of that, but I am looking forward to, to doing that. And yes, I have been to Buenos Aires and you go to a, a uh, a malonga is a tango dance. I went to malonga every night for nine nights, and it's a very interesting experience. So um, I very much enjoy it. Like I said, I'm looking forward to going back. Part of the issue with tango is that it's uh, uh, many of you are familiar with the scene with Robert De Niro in Scent of a Woman. It's right in the middle of the movie, and uh, uh, you're very, very close face to face with your partner. And so it's definitely not something you want to do during COVID period, but I'm hoping to get back to it. And thanks for asking it. Um, uh, I very much enjoy doing it and it's a very unique community. Thank you Dr. So David, I love how you put yourself out there and try all these different things and master all of them. It's, it's beautiful. I'm doing my best. And uh, along with Red there, I'm part of the, what I call the 100 plus club is that uh, I, I do eat carefully and um, I'm into different vitamins and supplements, as many of us are. And um, I also set the alarm this morning. I was at the gym just shortly after 7 a.m. Uh, I go to one of the big gyms here in Houston and use a variety of machines. And my, my story about going to the gym first thing in the morning, I do it three or four mornings a week, is if I work out first thing in the morning, nothing worse can happen all day. <laughs> As I like to conclude a lot of my interviews, is there anything I should have asked you that I did not? Uh, no, I think we did a pretty good job today, and I'm ready to get lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jacqueline, it's back to you. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Dr. David, I would love to have you come on our business show and talk about age discrimination and some of these other topics. Very happy to do that. Just, uh, uh, you know, glad to work it in as we did today. And thank you both of you so much for being such uh, a great host and for inviting me on the show. Well, it's our pleasure. I'm going to spotlight you again. If you can just share with our audience who should reach out to you and how should they contact you? Uh, well, as a professor, I'm happy to talk to people about coming back to uh, University of St. Thomas for their master's in business administration or graduate business degree. As a consultant, I work with uh, uh, many small businesses uh, uh, from five to 500 employees and uh, help them get set up with uh, employment applications, employee handbooks, and making tough decisions. Uh, one of the things I did, and in fact, I did it from Africa for one of my clients uh, uh, here in uh, Texas, not in Houston, but another city, uh, where uh, they had a difficult uh, personnel issue. And I do consult on those. And again, with an effort to make sure that the client uh, gets the situation handled and does not get sued or have a trip down to the EEOC, if at all possible. And the best way to reach you is by email? Uh, yes, we've given you one email. I have multiple emails, but that'll work, and then we can communicate from there. 
And for Thank people you, listening on the radio, if you could just share what that email address is. Yes, it's dshine at daviddshine.com. Uh, also, my consulting firm is called Claremont Management Group. And our website's real simple, World Wide Web, ClaremontManagementGroup.com. And Shine is spelled S-C-H-E-I-N. You got it. S-C-H-E-I-N, Shine. Thank you so much. Uh, Doctor, it's been an absolute pleasure. We'll be back in touch to get you on some of our other shows. And I hope you have a wonderful lunch. And congratulations again on the book launch. It's huge. Thank you. We look forward to getting one over to you. Would love that. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dave. Really appreciate you, Dave. Thanks Take again. care. Thank you again. Thanks. Fred, unbelievable. I cannot, I don't even know where to start with everything he's accomplished. It's, it's difficult on a good day, but you know, when you want to do something, you make it happen. It's just like your book. You didn't want to let it sit. You wanted it now and it's happening and it's been part of your life. There's something out there that needs to happen. It needs to happen now. Boom. You make it happen. And I think that's kind of the story, you know, as we get older and wiser and we're using our knowledge that, you know, if I had done that, then this would have been different. Well, today is today. Make it happen. Yes, you and I are in agreement on that. It's, I'm not one who waits around. It's like, I'm going to go out there and just give it a, my best shot and see what happens. Not everything works out well, but they're all learning experiences. And I'm just really grateful to you for taking the journey with me on this platform and also for being my book coach for book number two. Thank you so very much. I'm honored. All right, I'm going to spotlight you, and if you would share information about who should get in touch with you. Also talk a little bit about Talking Heads and the content that you're presenting. Talking Heads is an expert presentation, subject matter expert in this particular case on health and wellness, really in the niche of longevity. I've talked about how and and the body ages and what you can do to accelerate or decelerate the aging processes. That was the first couple presentations. Uh, the last presentation we did, we talked about the various aspects of disease. How does it grow in the body? And what 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 can you do to kind of stop it along the way? Can There's different roads coming in and you can do things about it. And most people don't know. In the next couple of segments, we're going to be facing the age related diseases, Alzheimer's and things like that. And again, there's several different ways that disease has a pathway into the brain. And so we're going to be talking about what causes it and what can we do about it and just putting out a lot of good information. And that's called Talking Heads. That's on Mondays on USA Global TV. And I believe it's at one o'clock central. Uh, And then the rest of me, if you need, I I write almost every day on health and wellness. Uh, I had a presentation. I didn't semi presentation last night with a military group and a lot of questions came up ironically on Alzheimer's. So the article I'm writing today will be publishing today on my blog and on social media is going to be on what happens when you suspect somebody actually might have Alzheimer's, what can you do? So that's the one I'm going to put out today, but regardless, uh, I speak quite often, uh, read at redolaughlin.com or red.olaughlin at gmail.com, but that's R E D. O L A U G H L I N dot com or red dot O'Laughlin. That's O L A U G H L I N at gmail dot com are two good ways to reach me. And I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about health and wellness in a presentation perspective. Or if you have a book you think you might want to talk about, yeah, please give me a call. I'm more than happy to at least answer your questions, if nothing else. Thank you so much, Red. You are a good man. I appreciate it. And uh, I think you and I are meeting right after this. So I look forward to that. Too. Okay. Well, if, if we are, we are. <laughs> okay. And Thanks not, again. And if not, we will. <laughs> Definitely. I'll see you backstage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I so appreciate you for being here and for following us. Uh, If you want to get information on any of our co-hosts, you can go over to our website, USA Global TV, 
at dot com. And you can also go to our YouTube channel, USA Global TV. I just wanted to share that in addition to being the founder of USA Global TV, I'm also a certified life and career coach. And I love to help people learn how to listen. I'm very much about inner peace. And I feel like if we were actually able to be more peaceful and to elevate our listening skills, we could have a lot less strife in this world than what we have now. What I see, excuse me, is a lot of over talking, a lot of trying to come up with solutions for other people, a lot of judgment. And when we are an effective, elevated listener, we don't have any of that. We offer a space that is safe for people to share how they feel without us judging them or having any expectations. So that's all we have for today. We're coming back tomorrow. I think we have nine more shows. If you've missed anything for so far this week, again, two ways to watch. Go over to our YouTube channel. What is it? Da, da, da. Yes, you got it. USA Global TV. And what's our website? The exact same. So thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Dave. Thank you, Red. And thank you, everybody who watches our shows and is supportive of our work. We'd love to have you on the platform. You can also go to our website and book your session to be a guest. Again, usaglobaltv.com. Thank you and God bless you all. Bye.